So in the last episode, we had a good look at how the theoretical side of liberalism, far from being the progressive wonderland many seem to think it is, is actually a much muddier and darker history than many give it credit for. Having now explored the dark side of liberal theory, in this video I would like to move on to examining some of the history of liberalism in practice. Because of course, we all know that liberal capitalist practice has in fact been very very successful, which is why liberals, and the right, are always lording it over socialists saying, where did socialism ever work? So this question is often in the context of suggesting that socialism is a nice idea, but it doesn't work. Which suggests that the speaker agrees that the socialist values, such as liberty, equality and solidarity, are desirable, and it is merely the practice that holds it back. So if the questioner is in good faith, then it follows that to understand if liberalism works, we should look for its success in bringing about liberty and equality and solidarity. In essence, the performance of a good social liberal society. So I'd like to flip it on its head, and ask when has liberal capitalism ever worked? I mean, on its own terms of protecting property relations and the bourgeois class, surely it has worked for quite a long time. But if we take it on these social terms, again, if we take the questioner of when socialism ever works at good faith, and judge it on these terms which liberalism also affirms, liberty, equality, and fraternity or solidarity, this allows us to ask, has liberal capitalism ever worked in these terms? The answer is, of course, nowhere and never. And as we have seen in the previous video, it's not really designed to do that, and if it did work then we wouldn't have a situation where the resources to solve world hunger could be provided seven times over from the profits that billionaires made in just 2017. And yet many people around the world are still starving. Equally, one could look at the history of liberal imperialism and make a sweeping judgement that the values they promoted in this sense were never enacted in any of the countries they invaded, and therefore, again, it does not look like for much of the world liberalism has ever worked. But rather than just make these sweeping statements, I'd like to look at the evidence in more detail in order to draw out these key examples of liberalism in practice. Obviously the whole history of liberalism is huge, and it would be impossible to sum it all up in one video, so I'm just going to draw out a few key examples which I think show clearly some of the failings of liberalism as it has been practiced, and by that method draw to a close the wider theme of liberalism and the left, before in the next two videos addressing the implications of the arguments we've been looking at for the relationship between liberalism and the far-right fascist tradition. The previous two videos have, as I said in each of them, been largely drawing out the argument of Ishe Lander in his book The Apprentice's Sorcerer, with a few additions from me, and a few things dropped. This video will use more examples from my own research, as I want to show how the theory explored in the last video works in practice, but it's still really just illustrating Lander's argument, so if you want to know more I encourage you to check out the book. One of the things I want to show by this process of exploring liberal practice is to illustrate how the disconnect between the commonly touted social values of liberalism and the highly capitalistic class-based concerns of classical liberal theory actually play out in the real world. As we shall see, far from defending these social values and rights, liberal countries often block the progress of rights for masses and minorities until it can no longer hold back the tide and then attempts to take credit for the values that it has grudgingly allowed and, in most cases, subtly limited and undermined in the process. We see this, of course, at the surface level, in how the masses were militated for the bourgeois revolution in France, but instead of the illusory liberty, egalité, fraternité, they got a dictatorship followed by a liberal capitalist state, as we discussed at the start of this project. Immediately after the French Revolution came another revolution, and this serves as a great illustration of the way that these social liberal values of the revolutionary project were reserved for the victorious few, the bourgeois, at the expense of their provision to those seen as lower. This revolution was of course the Haitian Revolution. It was a slave revolt inspired by the same liberal values as the French Revolution itself, but it was carried out by black slaves in the French colony of Haiti, and French troops were sent to put it down, as the post-revolutionary government refused to apply these values to those at the bottom of their power structure, or those considered racially other. It's reported that during the conflict, when the French arrived for battle, they were regularly greeted by Haitian revolutionaries seeing the Marseillaise, the revolutionary national anthem under which they had just fought their own aristocracy, and other revolutionary songs, the very songs the French troops themselves sang to keep their spirits up, 
This caused many ordinary lower class soldiers to question their own position in the conflict, and that caused sufficient discontent among the troops, in sympathy for the Haitian plight, that the effort to put down the revolution failed, and in spite of the best efforts of the supposedly revolutionary government of the French bourgeois, the Haitian Revolution succeeded in forming the world's first black republic. We can see another of the clearest examples of liberalism appearing to acquiesce to social demands on the surface, while covertly working to undermine them in the proposed solution, when we look at the history of one of liberalism's most celebrated institutions, democracy. And in this context, I want to talk about Charles Earl Grey. And yes, he is the same guy credited with that rather pleasant tea blend you've all heard of. Earl Grey. But apart from tea infused with bergamot, which I have to say is a policy of his with which I sympathise, Earl Grey is remembered as the man who brought democracy to the UK. Well, not for women or the working class, but it was the first time a significant proportion of the population got the vote. And, given that he was a local lad, in my home city, here in Newcastle, we even have a statue of him in the city centre, which celebrates the Great Reform Act which he passed by putting Grey on a big, phallic plinth to remind us what a dude he was. Unfortunately, Gray is less of a devout democrat than a grudging participant aiming to minimise the damage to the social order democracy might cause. You see, in 1832, the British population was by no means content with its place. For the past few decades, dissent had emerged through early trade unions, the Luddite campaigns against capitalist machines that robbed them of their labour value, against which the British government had deployed the cavalry to areas such as Yorkshire, the rise of many radical thinkers such as William Godwin, Thomas Paine, Robert Owen, Thomas Spence, also a local lad, and even the early feminist Mary Wolfsoncraft. And proto-Marxist ideas, particularly from some of these thinkers, had become in fairly common circulation, and now a movement called the Chartists were calling for democracy, and Gray intended to give it to them. But not because he loved democracy, but because he hoped by giving them a form of democracy crafted by the ruling class, he could limit the scope of this democracy, and, at the same time, use the offer of apparent democracy as a means to quiet many of the other desires of the masses. As he said to Parliament when discussing the Great Reform Act, If any persons should suppose that this reform will lead to ulterior measures, they are mistaken, for there is no one more decided against annual parliaments, universal suffrage, and the ballot than I am. My object is not to favour, but to put an end to such hopes and projects. And of course, though the franchise was expanded a few times after, in the 19th century and into the 20th century, it would be about 90 years until all men and women could vote in the UK. Again, rights not given because the liberal establishment decided to be nice, but because a movement rose up and demanded it, and threatened to upend the liberal order if some concession was not made. We can see the same effort at work in the end of slavery in the US, where they were so reluctant to lose all their cheap labour, they made it so you could still work for free in prison, and set about criminalising black life. Or in the grudging granting of civil rights in the 60s, again after a long campaign, had made it almost untenable to continue denying it. And again if you look at mortgage lending to black families, redlining and many other issues, not to mention police violence, the supposed legal equality has still not led to a real equality. Again it seems at every point, the liberal and capitalist structures have worked to undermine the principles of these reforms. Of course, as I've mentioned in previous videos, ContraPoint's video on racism in America offers some really good examples to support these points. America is also a good example of where liberal thinkers have curtailed democracy to suit their interests. The US Constitution had a great concern with protecting the educated few, those James Madison, author of the US Constitution, called the wealth of the nation. They were to be protected from the perceived tyranny of the majority, i.e. the will of the masses beyond his bourgeois background. As Chomsky notes, Jefferson and Madison believed that power should be in the hands of the natural aristocracy, men like themselves. They regarded slaves, paupers, and destitute labourers as an ever-present danger to liberty as well as property. So on both sides of the Atlantic, we see this will on behalf of the literal liberal elites to curtail democracy, to ensure the political dominance of their class in their own countries, and, as we saw in the previous video, to keep property relations as they are. All the same, they are willing to tolerate some degree of democracy at home, but in the foreign landscape we see the actions of Western liberalism often pan out with devastating effects. The relationship between the United States and South America throughout much of the post-war period is very illustrative of this fact, and to see an example of this, let's look at Guatemala. You see, in the eyes of the liberals of the US establishment at least, Guatemala got democracy wrong, 
They did the big liberal no-no and let democratic institutions influence property. You see, in 1951, Jacobo Arbenz was elected to power in Guatemala, and he carried out a policy of land reform to give land to landless peasants so that they could grow food and support themselves, essentially trying to give some land to the poor so they wouldn't starve. Unfortunately, this upset one of the largest owners of the land, the US corporation United Fruit, who wanted to use that land as they had for a long time to have poor Guatemalans work it for minimal pay in order to grow cheap bananas for US consumers. Not only was Guatemala's move an affront to property, but also contravened the Monroe Doctrine, another nice feature of American liberalism, where President James Monroe declared that the US should have unrestricted access to all the markets of South America. Yay, free trade! How very liberal of him. So the CIA came in and opposed our bends by force, bringing in a military dictatorship which would ensure America's interests. And we see this play out across the region, where the US has regularly intervened to back up dictators against democratic forces seeking to redistribute resources from the wealthy foreign companies to the local poor. In fact, they've done this in pretty well every South American country at some point, with notable examples including the Bay of Pigs invasion in Cuba, manufacturing and training the Contras to oppose the Sandinista government in Nicaragua, and of course the overthrow of elected socialist Allende in Chile in favour of Pinochet's brutal dictatorship. And this continues to this day, with Honduran coup in 2009 and the 2002 attempt to depose Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, it has been commented before that the best way to avoid a coup in South America is not to have an American embassy. And with the new president in Brazil who idolises the old US-backed dictatorship there, who knows what will come next in US-Latin American relations. Similarly, in the Arab world, we are often told that Arabs aren't ready for democracy to justify our support for their dictators. But of course, when, for example, in Egypt the Tahrir Square protests toppled the government calling for democracy, it took only about a year for Western powers to wholly support a military coup to subdue that democracy, which they felt had made the wrong decision, and support the return of military rule. Oh, and while we're here, remember the theory section where we still hadn't ticked off secularism and religious tolerance as features liberalism will drop for economic imperatives? Well, the liberal West propping up Middle East dictators is a good example of how to knock these two off fast. From one side, the Muslim Brotherhood government is not tolerable in Egypt and had to be replaced with the military. Not that I'm saying the Muslim Brotherhood is a great party, but they were elected. And we need only take a glance at regimes like Saudi Arabia to see that, for enough money, they can be sold out the other way. As in case you didn't know, Saudi Arabia is a theocratic, abusive monarchy which executes religious and political dissenters, enforces religious laws, and invades neighbouring countries. And the liberal West provides pretty much the entirety of the arms for them to do it, not to mention the logistical support, repairs, training, and even refuelling. Right now, British support staff are in Saudi Arabia, maintaining bombers flown by the Saudi pilots to enact a brutal siege and invasion of Yemen. So yeah, all that nice secular tolerance is out the window for an arms deal with a theocratic dictatorship. If you want another example of breaks with those values, the partition of India by the British Empire, splitting Pakistan and Bangladesh from India and deporting people from both sides to create separate Muslim and Hindu religious states at the cost of vast numbers of lives, along lines drawn by Mountbatten, a British man and cousin of King George V clearly without a great amount of consultation with the needs of the individuals in the local population. Having ventured into the imperialist realm a little, though, let's return to the conditions of the poor at home in these liberal imperialist societies. We, of course, cannot forget that the rise of liberalism was deeply intertwined with the Industrial Revolution, as well as the new bourgeois model of ownership of farms as opposed to common land ideas practiced by both the European peasantry and the natives of the New World. In the Americas, as is well documented, and in countries like Australia, this meant the dispossession of natives and genocide. This could be examined at length, but for now I will direct you to Sean's video on the Native American genocide, which offers a great example of the horrors enacted in this process. In Europe, this was often characterised by a number of policies called the Acts of Enclosure, which privatised common land and drove the peasantry, previously entitled to support themselves on this land, to seek work as employed labourers in the new liberal capitalist order either in mills, factories or mines, or continuing to do agricultural labour, but now under the employment of the new private landowners, rather than paying tithes to the Lord, as they did in the preceding feudal system. This was a process that took more than a little coercion, as peasants, given a little land, were perfectly capable of supporting themselves without a boss. However, in their employed labour, they often found themselves very poor, so they had to be denied the right to support themselves fully. A little support was offered as aid, but not enough to undermine the liberal capitalist interests, 
in fact possibly just enough to reduce their wages. We see this in a contemporary article for the influential commercial and agricultural magazine, which discussed the provision of land to poor farm labourers. The interest of the other claimants is ultimately concerned in permitting the labouring man to acquire a certain portion of land, for by this indulgence the poor rates must be speedily diminished, since a quarter of an acre of garden ground will go a great way to rendering the peasant independent of any assistance. However, in this beneficent intention, moderation must be observed, or we may chance to transform the labourer into a petty farmer, from the most beneficial to the most useless of all applications of industry. When a labourer becomes possessed of more land than he and his family can cultivate in the evenings, the farmer can no longer depend on him for constant work, and the haymaking and harvest must suffer to a degree which would sometimes prove a national inconvenience. So they want to give the worker enough land to subsidise their low wages by working for themselves in the evenings outside of their already paid labour, and by doing so to avoid poor rates, again a familiar modern anti-tax position from the rich at the expense of impoverished labourers but not enough so that they could think of avoiding the hard labour the farmer wants them to do, and is unwilling to pay them even enough to survive on for. Hence them needing the land to subsidise their wages through extra labour. The natural injustice of one suffering poverty when there is ample land to support them is commented on by John Steinbeck in the wonderful novel The Grapes of Wrath, where again under economic pressure from the capitalist establishment, American smallholders from Oklahoma and elsewhere, had been forced off the land by the banks during the Great Depression of the 1930s, and travelled to California in the vain hope of finding a good life there, but are faced with starving in a fertile land, watching private fields go unused as they starve. And a homeless, hungry man, driving the roads with his wife beside him and his thin children in the back seat, could look at the fallow fields which might produce food but not profit, and that man could know how a fallow field is a sin, and the unused land a crime against the thin children. And such a man drove along the roads, and knew temptation at every field, and knew the lust to take these fields, and make them grow strength for his children, and a little comfort for his wife. The temptation was before him always. The fields goaded him, and the company ditches with good water flowing were a goad to him. This from a system that defines itself on liberty and individualism, liberalism, where a tycoon has liberty to imagine their dreams and set thousands to work creating them, but where a hungry person hasn't got the liberty even to grow a crop to feed themselves or their families in an empty field. This quote, I think, also nicely illustrates the evil of private property, of hoarding the means of production and survival for private profit while people starve. I provided a deeper illustration of some of the extremes of this in my first video on the 2008 world food crisis, which is also a good example of the problems of liberalism prioritising capitalist property and profit over human survival. Of course, the result of enclosing land was to provide a new workforce for the expansion of capitalist-run industries, and the history of struggle this created is notable here. At first many jobs demanded 12 hours or more a day, 7 days a week. Weekends, 8 hour working days, and things like sick leave and holidays, essentially all workers' rights, were, again, not offered by the liberal bourgeois to ease workers' suffering, but demanded by workers, and given reluctantly. Again, a whole video could and may well be done on this, but I think this is enough for now. One aspect of liberal imperialism we haven't looked at yet is race. A common instrument of colonial power was to use race to divide and rule, which often involved identifying, or in some cases creating, out of little or no perceived difference in the population, two distinct ethnic groups and then promoting one over the other, making one powerful, if under the imperial state, and the other subservient. A particularly chilling example of this is in the country of Rwanda in Africa. As you probably know, Rwanda has been plagued by ethnic tensions and genocide, but what is often less examined is how those tensions started. And to explore this, let's look at a quote from an essay by two Canadian academics, Long and Mill, link in the description. The colonial powers that existed at the time of the Berlin Conference in 1885 allocated Rwanda to Germany, which after World War I was reallocated to Belgium under a League of Nations mandate. These colonizers, especially the latter, exacerbated the pre-existing feudal state through their idea that the Hutu and Tutsi belonged to distinct races. The Belgians deemed the Tutsi, who populated the ruling monarch and whose physical characteristics were considered more European, to be a superior people and instituted a formal classification system complete with identification cards based on both appearance and wealth. The complexity of relationships within the indigenous Rwandan society was simplified by colonial powers 
in a process of othering, and Rwandans were simply translated into superior versus inferior races. Being the beneficiaries of such pseudoscientific myths, Tutsis embraced these distinctions that, over time, evolved into a story of historic domination broadly accepted by Hutus and Tutsis alike. Despite their numerical minority, Tutsis enjoyed an elevated status within Rwandan society, and that was demonstrated through such various privileges as occupation within the administrative hierarchy and admission to colonial church-run schools. While Belgians exploited the coffee and tea plantations in Rwanda, the forces of nationalism and racial antagonism grew from the primarily Hutu population that had long been ignored by the Belgian administration, a situation that fostered progressively increasing resentment on the part of the Hutu population. Hutu hatred toward Tutsi can be seen in part as the manifestation of opposition to imperial power insofar as colonial empires used the Tutsi to pursue their interests locally within Rwanda. Born from this were voices of radicalism that rallied around the Hutu power mantra. In 1962, the wave of European decolonization reached Rwanda and it became an independent nation. Given their numerical majority, a Hutu government was installed in a general election. That the Belgians facilitated this reversal in power can perhaps be seen as a recognition of the historical oppression of the Hutu people, or as an act of retribution against Tutsi nationalists. Far from settling extremism, political authority empowered it. Social pressures that were long building resulted in a massacre of Tutsis in December 1963 and foreshadowed future events. One race-based dictatorship was replaced by another, and thousands of Tutsis switched places with Hutus as refugees in neighbouring countries. Rwanda's history as a colonised nation cemented racial intolerance between Rwandans and led to several waves of citizens exiled from their own country. So we see the Belgians in Rwanda divided a complex population into two simple groups, separated by surface features of visible ethnicity, promoted one and built a mythology to support them, but this antagonised the other, larger, part of the population. This was all in aid of making the people easier to rule. Then, when leaving, these good-thinking Belgian liberals decided to reverse it in some sense of vague, unthought-out social justice, and one race-based dictatorship was replaced by another. Massacres took place, people were forced out, and in 1994, it culminated in up to a million Tutsis being killed in an act of genocide. Racialization was not just something imposed on imperial subjects, though. As we saw with Canton Mill in the previous video, it was also common in the ruling imperial elites, justifying their dominance over these people. A very good example of this comes from beloved British establishment figure, former politician of both the Liberal and Conservative parties, and avid imperialist racist. Winston Churchill. Here is how he justified the imperial power of Britain, which in his early life he spent many years brutally enforcing, over the natives of the countries it dominated. I do not agree that the dog in a manger has the final right to the manger, even though he may have lain there for a very long time. I do not admit that right. I do not admit, for instance, that a great wrong has been done to the Red Indians of America or the black people of Australia. I do not admit that a wrong has been done to these people by the fact that a stronger race, a higher race, a more worldly wise race, to put it that way, has come in and taken their place. Here Churchill defends the actions of the Empire, specifically against the American and Australian natives, on a clear white supremacist platform. And remember that these are both races which the British, subjected to a brutal genocide and the seizure of all but a few scraps of their historic land, but white supremacy as a justification for genocide? That doesn't sound like the Churchill we're told about. More like that guy he fought against. But that's something we'll pick up next episode. So I've talked a lot about classical liberalism, and many of my examples are at least half a century old. So finally, I want to give you an example to show these ideas are alive and well here in the 21st century. And to do that, I could pick from a wide variety of examples, but I want to look at a politician whose rule I lived under for much of my young life former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair. This argument could easily be made about Clinton or Bush, or even Thatcher or Reagan, or even Obama, or yet many more others. But I think Blair brings together many of the threads we have looked at, and encapsulates this clash of classical liberalism, or neoliberalism as the economic liberal brand of today has renamed itself, and liberal social values, and the victory of the economic side, in a very broad way. Also, I lived through all of his time in government, so... I just remember the things that happened, so it's easier for me. I could probably do a much longer piece on Blair, and maybe I will one day, but for now I'm just going to go over some key points that reflect our discussion here. 
Anthony Charles Linton Blair, or Tony Blair, was elected Prime Minister of the UK in 1997 after 18 years of Conservative rule by Margaret Thatcher and John Major, and was elected with high hopes in the population and an apparently social liberal platform, united with a neoliberal economic platform which in essence continued to expand upon Margaret Thatcher's economic policies. He was quoted at the time as saying, I believe Margaret Thatcher's emphasis on enterprise was right. This was underpinned by a philosophy called the Third Way, credited to Anthony Giddens, who himself is a follower of 20th century liberal thinker John Rawls. So how did he marry these two sides to his policies? Well, he refused to tax the rich, to allow social projects to be well funded, and while he did institute a long-needed minimum wage, yes, we only got a minimum wage in the UK in 1997, before that there was no limit to how little your boss could pay you, much of his social programme was undermined, exactly as we saw in the theory video, by his concern for protecting and promoting capitalist economics. One great example of this is the use of private funding to back up public projects through a system called PFI, or Private Finance Initiative. This was a system by which public projects, especially buildings like schools, roads, hospitals, and even military facilities, were not funded by government loans, but were under contracts by which the private company built the facility and rented it back to the government for a profit. Not only that, but these contracts gave the private company rights to run maintenance thereafter at a further unregulated cost to the taxpayer. These deals could also be sold on easily to other companies to avoid accountability. The result of this was huge administration fees for public maintenance, with a hospital being charged £333 to change a light bulb, for example, and huge rents, which are far more expensive than borrowing money up front. It should always be obvious that privatisation will be more expensive than direct state investment, as the private sector has to turn a profit where the state does not. But this was an especially expensive form of privatisation by the back door. Here we see how Blair's obsession with market capitalist methods saddled his social projects, like education. Ask me my three main priorities for government, and I tell you, education, education, and education in debt and left them to the mercy of the market, having to pay excessive amounts for minor maintenance, making millions for the rich at the expense of money that could have been used running and improving the services. Indeed, Blair's rise in the Labour Party itself, which had traditionally had a reasonably large socialist section, was building on over a decade of policy by his indirect predecessor Neil Kinnock, aimed at driving socialists into the background in favour of a more right-wing economic policy like Thatcher's, on the assumption that this was the only way to get elected ushering in a period of neoliberal acquiescence in the Labour Party, which has only recently begun to crumble, and has yet to crumble in many similar parties in North America and Europe. He even removed Clause 4, the socialist claim of the Labour Constitution, promising to secure for the workers by hand or by brain the full fruits of their industry and the most equitable distribution thereof that may be possible upon the basis of common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange, and the best obtainable system of popular administration and control for each industry and service. This right-wing tendency was noticed in Blair from the start. The Atlantic magazine in 1996 even quoted a supposed friend of Blair's, who remained unnamed, who said, you have to remember that the great passion in Tony Blair's life is his hatred of the Labour Party. The result of all this was Blair really achieved no positive change in how Britain's economy worked. He merely added a few unnecessarily expensive creature comforts, while at the same time continuing with privatisation by bringing market forces into the NHS and public services through the back door by methods like PFI, and even increasing the cost of education, changing our previously free universities to cost £3,000 a year a figure that was trebled by the subsequent Conservative government. Hardly a project to help those most in need. He really offered backhanders to the rich under the veil of social investment. Unsurprisingly, when he left office, he was repaid with a number of cushy jobs at private banks with high pay and minimal hours, obviously for some of the institutions he had helped most. While looking at the relation between economic and social concerns in British liberal politics, I want to give a special shout out here. It's a bit off topic, but I think it's one of the most farcical examples of this I can pick out. So the Liberal Democrats, once the third largest party in British politics, had run in the 2010 election on a socially liberal platform, offering free universities, decriminalisation of cannabis, and various other socially liberal benefits. But then they ended up propping up the Conservative Party in a coalition. Aside from reversing all their election promises, for example they had promised to end university fees but then voted through a Tory bill to triple them, there is one standout moment of Liberal trade-off that really sums up this attitude. 
The Liberal Democrats wanted a 5p plastic bag tax. That is a consumer end environmental policy where people, whatever their income, and most of us were getting a lot poorer at the time under the coalition's austerity policies, had to pay 5 pence to use a plastic bag at the supermarket. And to get this apparently oh-so-wonderful reform through, what did they trade with their Conservative partners? They agreed to vote through a cut to disability benefits, taking money from the most vulnerable in our society. So, as you can see, great custodians of the social liberal values there. Anyway, back to Blair. So we've seen how the economic concerns of Blair, and later the Lib Dems, undermined his social projects, and this becomes more apparent when we look at the event he's most remembered for, his co-production with George W. Bush, the war on terror, and the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq. So in 2001, obviously, the world suffered a huge collective trauma, which would come to define the politics of the new century. Even here in the UK, we were already shocked by 9-11. I remember hearing about it when I was picked up from school, and not being sure if I was dreaming. It felt terrifying and unreal. And I, like anyone else, was in shock. But what followed was a further nightmare, and one of our country's and government's own making. And socially liberal Blair was oh so keen to get right in the middle of it. So the obvious policy outcome of 9-11 was the wars. Wars we now know were based on abject lies and, of course, did no good in catching the 9-11 attackers because, let's be real, bombing the shit out of a country would clearly be a less effective strategy for finding an international fugitive than, say, a sustained police-style investigation looking at leads, which is how they later actually found bin Laden in Pakistan, where they weren't bombing. Not that the US and UK did not bomb Pakistan illegally, but this wasn't the bit where they were bombing, and nor did that bombing really help them find him. Blair added to these lies, taking up Saddam as a threat, and promoting the false UK claim that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction that could be deployed in 45 minutes, which was at the time called Sexed Up and the Dodgy Dossier. But it was no less fake news than what Trump does today. It was a lie to get UN permission to start a war. On top of all this is the fact that, especially with Iraq, the real motivations for war were known, at least in part, in advance, and this made the war incredibly unpopular, promoting the largest march in the UK's history, also my first protest when I was like 14. People saw it as a war for oil, and while in retrospect, oil was probably just one of a more complex marriage of multiple economic and imperialist interests, we do see today that oil companies did make a lot of money. So with his imperialism, esotericism, and undergirding of social policy with economics which he seeks to protect from socialist threats, Blair is in many ways the very embodiment of this classical liberal agenda. We can even look at his regime change policy, predicated on the notion that places like Iraq had populations that couldn't fix their own dictatorship and needed the wiser, more powerful, liberal Westerners to come and fix it for them, militarily, and with very little attention to their needs. We can see it as reflective of the patriarchal imperialist racism practiced by people like Churchill in his description of a stronger, more worldly wise race, as we saw in his earlier quote. In Iraq, we even see the classic imperialist divide and rule tactics that we saw in Rwanda earlier. Saddam had been a Sunni, and though his regime was not characterized by this aspect, they decided to enforce a Shia government on the country and encourage a previously low level tension in the divide between these two groups. Far from making the country more stable, however, this led to an ongoing bitter sectarian conflict. What policy decisions led to this, and whether or not this was a deliberate outcome, is a bigger discussion for another time, but certainly it seems that there was an attempt to apply the same old divisive imperialism in order to secure power. There was, of course, though, another side to the war on terror. A huge intensification of surveillance and the security state at home. Through the Patriot Act in the US, and under Blair through the Anti-Terrorism Crime and Security Act, and a number of subsequent security reforms. This not only created a climate of fear, mostly of Islamic people, which contributed to the rise of modern Islamophobia, but also involved new rules on protest and a new discourse of nationalism, patriotism and militarism. And, at the same time, this legislation was in fact used to increase surveillance and repression on groups completely unconnected to 9-11. In the book Undercover, journalists Rob Evans and Paul Lewis point out that after 2001, there was actually an explosion in funding for surveillance and undercover infiltrators against left-wing activists and environmentalists. And over the following years, we have seen anti-terror legislation used to curtail or criminalise protest, even up to the financial crash in the Occupy movement, as well as to justify mass surveillance of all internet traffic, 
and crackdowns on academic freedom through things like the Prevent Agenda in the UK. In all of this, we see that liberal love of surveillance culture, which I briefly mentioned in Chapter 2. All of these things about Blair are reinforced in his recent return to public life. The former Prime Minister has recently done a number of media appearances, so let's see what he has to say. Here he is attacking the new socialist Labour leader because of his opposition to the Western tradition of foreign policy. And looking at his record, this is clearly a defence of invasive imperialist attitudes that led to the Iraq war and have long defined UK foreign policy. This is a different Labour Party. You know, look, after the Second World War, and it's important that we understand this in terms of understanding the traditions of the Labour Party, Attlee and Ernie Bevan, who was the foreign minister of the, the Labour government, they founded NATO. They actually developed the nuclear bomb of the UK. And they chose the United States and the transatlantic alliance, opposed uh, the Soviet Union, fought alongside the US in the Korean War. I mean, their whole position was against that anti-Western politics. And many of the people who were on the left at that time was sort of, in a sense, either marginalised in the Labour Party or went out of the Labour Party. They joined the Communist Party, they joined various Trotskyist groups. Then, you know, in the 1960s and so on, all of these things sort of had another flowering of different types of organisation. There was then a, an attempt to really come into the Labour Party in a big way, the end of 70s, early 80s, under the Tony Benn kind of revolution. And that was repulsed. And of course, he is also attacking even the most modest of left-wing agendas. Corbyn is no revolutionary. His policies are basically Keynesian, although I think they do offer hopeful avenues for travel, not least the idea of having a prime minister who's not a blood-hungry imperialist. But they don't really go beyond the sort of social democracy we see in a country like Sweden. But for Blair, this is something to oppose. However, his attitude is different when it comes to new right-wing projects. But people worry, and they're anxious, that some people who come into our countries don't abide properly by our values. There are issues to do with integration, and we've got to address those questions. I mean, one of the things you guys came under attack for was, was having Steve Bannon as one of your, your guests, I think, in, in America. My view is you've got to engage with the people who disagree with you. And you've got to be prepared to go out and argue your case and listen to them and build bridges to them. So Blair thinks Corbyn, a democratic socialist who was in his party for the whole of his rule, and was elected to the leadership with the largest majority in Labour Party history, is not worth building bridges to and has to be removed. But you know who is worth building bridges to? White supremacist, racist propagandist Steve Bannon. In power, Blair was prone to similar triangulations to the far right, toughening immigration policy and calling people's immigration concerns legitimate. The BNP, a fascist group at the time, boasted that this was a great boost to them on the doorstep. Anyway, I'm glad no one's doing that today. Oh, wait. This sort of triangulation is a terrible idea and only serves to boost the public perception of legitimacy in right-wing racist propaganda narratives. But that's something we can look at more next time. So here we are. This was a fairly small smattering of examples to show this point. Many may argue that these are just mispractices of liberalism and that proper liberalism would avoid these problems. But... In context of the theory I went into last episode, I think we can see that classical liberal thought does create theoretical precedent for all of these actions. And, seen through the lens of the history of liberalism we covered in part one, these symptoms can now be seen as built out of structural problems of class interest in the liberal canon. It's authorship by and for a class of people whose fortunes depended on capitalism, exploitative industries, coercion, racism and imperialism, and who created a political philosophy which they bent to allow for many of their own worst practices. Further, we can see that the forces pushing the good values of liberalism, all those pretty social values that many people associate with liberalism, all the liberty, equality and solidarity, are largely pushing these values onto the liberal bourgeois capitalist regime. These values aren't concocted by liberalism apropos of nothing, they are adopted defensively when they are pushed by the forces which they oppose. And this is my point. To me, this history shows that these values we love, these things Wikipedia associates with liberalism, are not achievable through liberalism. To achieve these values, we need to acknowledge the philosophies not just of the bourgeois liberals, but of the classes below. To achieve the goals of liberal humanism, we need Marxism to understand how capitalism undermines it. 
We need critical race theory and post-colonial theory to understand the impacts of these oppressions and how to solve them. We need theories looking at gender and sexuality and all these things in order to unpick the various barriers our society has built to equality, liberty and justice. Essentially, to save these liberal ideas, you need the radical left. You need socialism. Because these should be our goals. And if these are your goals, then maybe liberalism isn't for you. Of course, if you don't share these goals, then maybe your relationship with liberalism is different. Maybe you would like to prioritise the economic goals. And in the next two episodes of this mini-series, I'm going to look at the relationship between liberalism and those who do support the economic values while being totally opposed to liberty and equality. And that is, obviously, fascism. So I hope you'll join me then to have a look at the relationship between liberalism and the far right. So, thanks for listening everyone, and if you're really enjoying this series, or my other videos, and you'd like to see me make more of them, then why don't you drop me a dollar or so on Patreon? Your money helps me make more videos, and just generally survive while I do it, and, you know, that's really nice, and it's really lovely that so many of you have already given me money on Patreon. So I'd like to thank Emily Dickinson, Natty, Zabesian, Daniel Stenson, Geshtin, The Cooler Noah, and Thought Slime. And extra special thanks to Peter Benzoni and George Soros. You guys are all fantastic, and thank you for your faith in me and this channel. I also want to thank at Blue Legenda, who does the animations for these videos and the original graphic design, and makes it all look really cool. And yeah, so I hope you'll all join me next time, and I think the next two videos are the most exciting of the series where we're going to be exploring the connections between the liberal tradition and fascism. So I hope to see you there. Bye!